If you're in the choir, you're asked to make your way up here to the, to the choir loft, please. good to welcome you here today. Glad that y'all are with us. Uh, now that I have your attention, a couple things I need to make, uh, make you aware of. Uh, on the back of your bulletins is a list of donations that we're asking for. The association is collecting these uh, donations for the Georgia Baptist Children's Home just outside of uh, Baxley. And so if you can bring some of these uh, items, if you'll bring them and just put them on the table. If you've got them in a bag, we'll, we'll get them and we'll get them at a, uh, moved out of the way. But uh, just ask you to collect these things. We need to have them uh, into the association office by Thursday, May 25th. Uh, next Sunday, of course, is Mother's Day. And so uh, I know usually we have a, a good attendance for that day, so we're looking forward to that. Vacation Bible School is June 23rd and 24th. The 23rd, is that the, that's the Friday night. Okay, uh, we'll have a kickoff that Friday evening at 6. I don't know. We'll, we will get back with you on that. We got time. We'll have a kickoff that Friday night. Uh, there it says 5.30. Uh, and if you'd like to help with Vacation Bible School, uh, see Suzanne. Uh, there, there's just different areas we could use some help, so just get with her, let her know. VBS will be on the 24th, and then on that Sunday night, the 25th, we will have family night that night uh, during our evening worship, and we'll have a fellowship uh, that night as well. So that's uh, what that, that, are, that is some of the things that are, is coming up. Uh, on a prayer list, just make you aware of a couple of things. Um, Wednesday night, the Ann Carver family and Mary Beverly family were added to the prayer list upon their passing. Uh, James Spivey uh, was added. Also, uh, Keith Brown uh, suffered another stroke, uh, we think, on Friday morning. They took him to the hospital in Waycross. Uh, he's still having, uh, he is on his way home. As a matter of fact, he probably is home now. Uh, Wesley was bringing him home. Uh, they asked, uh, if, you need to, if you want to talk to them, send a text to Angie, but she got sick last night, so just give him a couple days rest up. His speech is affected again. Uh, his left arm, is, he still has some weakness there, so just uh, get, if you want to find out, Lucille is over at Little Memorial today. They were starting their revival today, and Sammy is preaching the service this morning, so Lucille went with him to hear, to hear him, and then the revival speaker will be starting tonight over there, Dennis Dean will be starting night there at Little Memorial. Obviously, Keith will not be able to be there. He's still tired. Uh, so just uh, keep him in your prayers as he recovers. Um, anything else? All right, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And then uh, Brother Ray is not with us today. He hurt his back yesterday. May had him out working hard. And isn't that how it went down, May? May said she didn't have him working. Uh, so it's on, he's on his own. But he hurt his back yesterday. He said this morning he called me. He couldn't hardly sit, couldn't hardly stand. And so Suzanne's going to be leading our music for us this morning. This is her trial run because when May and Ray are out sailing on the seven seas in June, uh, Suzanne will be leading music for us That's uh, for two Sundays in. So anyways, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we begin our worship service. Father, we come before you today. We ask, uh, Holy Spirit, that you would uh, minister to us today as we worship together, that you would lead us in our worship, that the name of Jesus would be exalted in this place, and that your name would be lifted high. For you are worthy of our worship. And Lord, we are to turn our attention to you, to focus upon you. 
And Lord, thank you again for your grace and your goodness to us. And I ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before Suzanne makes her way up here, I want to share something with you. Friday, Brandy and Adelie were on the American Family Network radio. It was when Adelie read last Sunday for us her essay on uh, the fifth commandment, honor your father and your mother. Well, she, they did the radio interview with Brandy and Adelie on Friday. Blaine is going to, going to get the link to Suzanne. She will send that out on the remind text. And you can click on that link and go listen to it. It's about an hour long. Their part's not quite an hour, so you can kind of fast forward through the first part of it. I think somewhere around the, the 12 to 15 minute marks where it begins. But make sure you listen all the way to the end. I didn't listen all the way to the very end, but listen to the very end. And you say, why? We'll just listen to the very end. But anyways, uh, it, uh, we'll get that link out to you. And Adelie, where's Adelie at? Oh, yeah, you did such a good job. So proud of you. She's like, he's just sucking up to me. Anyways, all right, would you stand? Good morning. We're going to sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. Thank you. You may be seated.
Miss Carrie Collins is going to come this morning and sing us a special. Thank you, Miss Carey. Thank you, Suzanne, for leading on short notice this morning. Uh, so now we know she can do it in June when Ray and May are out sailing the seven seas. Won't really be on the seven seas, I don't think. But uh, anyways, but Carrie, thank you. Great job. You need to sing more. Uh, use that talent the Lord has given you. Miss Pat, are you taking the kids? Huh? Mohawk Ellis. <laughs> I mean, surely. 
I'm sorry. Lucille, Louise, if I'm looking at you and I call you a name, I'm talking to you. Huh. Kenny, I still ain't thought of it. Me and Kenny were talking about it before church. Uh, any of you have memory issues? You know, they advertise that Prevagen on TV. I'm about ready to try it to see if it, if it does anything for me. Uh, but anyways, I, I meant Shirley. I said Pat. I hope I said Lucille a while ago when I talked about she's gone to a little Memorial Day because uh, her brother Sammy is preaching. But uh, anyways, let's take your Bibles and let's go to the book of uh, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 18 this morning as we have been going through John's Gospel. And uh, let me just say this, going forward, I'm going to try to pick the pace up a little bit. I, you can dive down deep into some of this and some of it. In some areas we will, but in some other areas where I can uh, get through this, because I want us to, to see this, and this ties in with what we're looking at on Sunday evenings in the book of First John, because it's the same author. Uh, the Apostle John wrote the Gospel of John under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He also wrote First John, and he's here, this is tied in, this first chapter particularly of the Gospel of John ties in with what we've been looking at on Sunday nights about Jesus being in the flesh, not a phantom. And so we're going we're gonna to look at this today. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to stand with me if you're able. I'm going to read verses 14 through 18 of John chapter 1. So if you would stand with me. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have all received, in grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. You may be seated and join with me in a moment of prayer. Father, we ask Your blessings upon Your Word today, that You administer to us by Your Holy Spirit through Your Word, and that, Lord, You would help us to uh, seek to be uh, closer with the Lord Jesus Christ, to be uh, a, a more faithful follower, a more obedient follower, Lord, I thank you that your word tells us that where sin abounds in our life, that grace abounds that much more. That's not a permission slip to go and sin, but Lord, we do know that our sin is covered by the blood of Jesus. And so we lift up your name today, and Lord Jesus, you are worthy. And so be with us in this time this morning, and I ask this all in Jesus' name, amen. I also wanted to just share one thing with you uh, or two things, actually, but one, uh, Wesley asked me on behalf of uh, Keith and Angie to thank you for your prayers and your calls. Uh, Angie hadn't been answering the phone. I've, I know that because I've tried several times, and Colby told her not to be answering the phone, just to let it go, to voicemail or whatever, just to deal with, just to, to kind of help with Keith. But they are, they are very appreciative of uh, your prayers, and so they just wanted you to know that. Secondly, Jan and I yesterday, remember we had the Christian Motorcycle Association with us back, uh, I think it was the last Sunday in February, or the first Sunday in March, I don't remember exactly when it was, uh, last Sunday in February. And they were here, and you know, we gave, we took a love off for them. Well, yesterday was their big, their big ride that they call Run for the Sun, S-O-N. Uh, and so Jan and I went up there to be just kind of a part of that with them yesterday. They didn't do as well yesterday as they did last year. Last year they brought in on the day they did the Run for the Sun ride, they, they brought in about 12,000 last year. Yesterday they only got about uh, a little over five at last count. So they were down, but I, wanted, I, but I share this with you because they have been here with us two years in a row. Uh, Mike and Kelly came and showed the video. They don't know of, of a pastor receiving a motorcycle. They don't know that they raised enough to purchase a motorcycle. But we, Pleasant Hill, has still, two years in a row, exceeded for their chapter any other church or any other organization giving to the Christian Motorcycle Association. 
And when they were here with us, we didn't have a much larger crowd than what we have today, and we gave almost $1,100 to them. And I want to say thank you on behalf of CMA and what they're doing. The money that they raised, even though they, they may not have raised enough as a chapter to purchase a motorcycle, it goes towards the purchase of a motorcycle for a pastor in a third world nation that is seeking to, to spread the gospel. And so uh, they had, that was their big day yesterday. Uh, they can't have rides and they can't do raffles and uh, some of these other things. They're allowed to have one ride a year that is their big fundraiser. Uh, and other than that, they go out and speak at churches and whatnot. But I just wanted to share that with you. Now then, we're here in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse 14, he says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And it follows what he opened up the Gospel with when he said in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Well, that's important because when you look at what John says uh, in verse 15, that John bore witness to him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me. John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. And John the Baptist was about six months older than the Lord Jesus Christ. But John knew that Jesus preceded him, that Jesus uh, was preexistent. Before John was conceived in the womb of his mother Elizabeth, uh, which was prior to Jesus being conceived, conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit, where well, John physically was six months older, Jesus always existed. And that's what he says here. Remember what he said in verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now he says to us here in verse 14, And the Word became flesh. See, there are those that John, as, we looked in, as we've been going through 1 John, the, the Gnostics, who said that, have, there, you know, there were those who said he didn't have a physical body, that he was just a phantom, that he appeared, but he really was a ghost. Uh, there, and then there were others, not really a ghost, but they would say a phantom, an, an apparition, if you will. There were those that actually taught that. And then there were those that taught that Jesus had a human body, but he was just like you and I, and that the divine Christ came upon him at his baptism and left him prior to his crucifixion. But if that is who Jesus is, he's not who he said he was in the Bible because he, it would have been impossible for him to have been raised from the dead after his crucifixion. And if it was impossible for him to be raised from the dead, then you and I have no hope. And so John is combating those teachings, and we see that particularly in the book of 1 John, but he's making mention of that here in the Gospel of John. He says, and the Word became flesh. Now I want you to think about that. God who spoke everything into existence, just spoke, created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the solar systems, uh, the galaxies that you can go out at night and look up and see on a clear night. If you get out into a dark enough spot, you can really see a lot. But when you look at what's on this earth, we got mountains and valleys and desert and prairies uh, we've got oceans and seas and rivers and streams. We've got all these things. We've got the animals. We've got the birds of the air and the different types of birds. You've got the animals. You have cattle and goats and sheep and lions and tigers and bears. You know, you've got all these things. And then you look at humanity. God created. Took on a human body. Is my mic cutting in and out? All right, flip me to the pulpit mic, and I'll just stand still. I don't know why that's cutting out. but uh, And so the God of all creation enters into his creation and takes on a body of flesh and bone and blood. And he lived on this earth and he experienced uh, the writer in Hebrews uh, we're not quite sure the author but under the inspiration of, of the Holy Spirit the writer in Hebrews tells us in Hebrews chapter 2 uh, beginning in verse 14 inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. 
For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things, in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. So he, he took on a body there, he says, of flesh and blood. And you say, well, I, I believe that. But there are those that would perhaps deny that. And we'll be looking at that tonight about those who deny Christ. But just a page over in Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 14, he said, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so John says, and the word became flesh and Jesus came to this earth. Isaiah seven fourteen prophesied that he would be born of a virgin. In Matthew chapter one, we find the account where Joseph in a dream, Joseph knows that Mary is pregnant. But he knows that he is not the father. And if you go back and you read in Matthew 1, 18 through 25, you find there that Joseph was minded to put her away privately. He did not want to embarrass her or humiliate her, uh, but he knew that he was not the father. And that, that was something. But in a dream, an angel appeared to him and told him that what was conceived in Mary was of the Holy Spirit and that he was to take her to be his wife. And that he was to name him Jesus. And we find that same account, or not the same account, but over in Luke chapter 1, when the angel Gabriel appears to Mary and says, Blessed are, are you among women, not above women, but among women. And the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and you are going to conceive and give birth to, to God himself. God is coming here. And so Jesus, his, in his flesh, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit in the womb of the Virgin Mary. But he took on a body just like you and I. And as the writer in Hebrews says, he was tempted in all points. He knows what it's like to face temptation, yet he never, never gave in, never surrendered to temptation. He never sinned. But he took on a body of flesh for you and I. And in his humanity... Jesus went through some of the same things you and I got. In the gospel, we'll see here in John chapter 4, uh, verse 6, he talks about Jesus being tired, being weary, that Jesus, he got tired. Do you ever get tired? Uh, me and Kenny were talking before church, and Kenny, I still ain't thought of it, but we were talking about, he, he, you know, he said he's getting tired of these hours that, that he's working. And uh, Donna's like, no, you just keep working, making that money. And I got more things to buy. But anyways, I get a thumbs up, not an amen, but that'll work. Uh, but, you know, working over there at Progress Rail, working 10-hour days, and every other weekend having to work, you know, Friday and Saturday, uh, just getting tired. We get tired. Uh, Sherry, the end of the school year is at hand. Uh, Suzanne, amen. School, well, you got summer lunch program, I guess, but it's not quite like, this, but it's, it's getting, and you get teachers, they talk about the teachers are, are, are tired and, you know, they're ready for the end of the school year. I can tell you the bus drivers are ready for the end of the school year. At least this bus driver is ready for the end of the school year. Twelve and a half more days. You know, that's, but anyways, uh, Jesus got tired. And John 4, 7 says Jesus got thirsty. You ever get thirsty and just need that water? In John 11, verses 33 and 35, it says there that Jesus groaned and that Jesus wept. Jesus actually cried. There when he was going to raise Lazarus, the shortest verse in the Bible, John 11, 35, says Jesus wept. And John 19, verses 28 through 34, that tells us that while Jesus was on the cross, that he thirsted, that he bled, and that he died. You and I are going to experience death it is coming for each and every one of us unless the lord jesus christ returns first and jesus experienced death but he was also raised from from uh, from the tomb bodily and john 20 verses 24 through 29 he tells us there that he's got a glorified body and so when his disciples saw him after the resurrection i mean he told him he says he, you know he told thomas when thomas was not there when jesus had appeared to the disciples at one time and thomas said unless i 
see the nail prints and unless I put my hand in his side, I'll not believe. But then when he sees Jesus, he didn't even have to touch him. Jesus said, here, Thomas, touch me. I mean, he had a body. And, and Thomas said, my Lord and my God. He, he didn't need to touch him because he knew it was Jesus. In Mark chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, we find there that Jesus experienced anger. Now, his anger was different than mine and your anger a lot of times. A lot of times, mine and your anger is a selfish or a self-centered anger. We're, we're angry about something that didn't go our way. Uh, there are occasions when we will have self-righteous anger. Uh, or righteous anger, not self-righteous, but righteous anger, being angry over uh, abuses that we may see, uh, just different things. Jesus, though, was angry with the Pharisees because in Mark 3, there was a man that, that came to Jesus there in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he had a withered hand. And Jesus asked him, said, is it, is it okay to heal on the Sabbath and, and they looked at him and Jesus it said looked at them with anger because they cared more about the rules and the regulations than they did about a man with a withered hand and they were more concerned that Jesus healed a man with a withered hand on the Sabbath and not that the man's hand had been healed and they were so angry with Jesus that they wanted to kill him they plotted they began to plot to kill him and Jesus was angry with them over the hardness of their hearts so Jesus experienced these things, his humanity. And so these, it would say Jesus never really was a man. Or some just say that Jesus was a good moral example. The Bible does not leave you that option. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is fully God, fully man. And John says here, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That phrase, dwelt among us, it's from a Greek word, theomai, which... The only reason I tell you that, we get our English word theater from the Greek word theoma. Theater. What do you do when you go to a movie theater? You say, well, I, order, I get popcorn. I get milk duds. Now, you don't go to a movie theater to get popcorn and milk duds. You may get that while you're there. But you go to the movie theater to do what? To watch a movie. And at the price at which you would pay to go watch a movie today, if you go to the theater, it's not good to fall asleep at the movies. You just, you've done invested quite a bit of money, especially if you've got that popcorn, milk duds, and Coke, and all that other stuff. You know, you, you, you get that. That word means to behold. That, that word, he says, when we beheld, uh, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, excuse me, we beheld his glory, that that is the word theomai. The dwelt among us is a different. It literally means he pitched his tent. When it says he dwelt among us, he tabernacled among us. When you remember in the Old Testament when Moses built the tabernacle, God had given the instructions for the tabernacle. They were to put the, have the walls, but they were to erect the tabernacle there in the wilderness. God literally came and his glory filled that tabernacle in the wilderness, the Shekinah glory, and so that the people were frightened. Then when in Solomon's temple, when Solomon dedicated his, uh, the temple that he built, the glory of God filled the temple, and the people were overwhelmed with the glory of God. That's what when he says here, and he dwelt among us, he pitched his tent among us. The word became flesh, and he pitched his tent. He tabernacled here. He came to this earth, he says, and we saw him, God, God's glory. It signified his presence among his people. And God in Christ physically now walking with his disciples, healing the sick, the lame, the deaf, the mute, the blind, bringing dead back to life, but also bringing spiritual life. He says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent. And then he says, and we beheld his glory. Beheld, that is the word theomite. I was a little bit mixed up. See, I'll tell you about memory issues. But it means that he said we looked and we, we watched him. That's what John says in 1 John chapter 1 when he begins his, we saw this uh, when we began our study through 1 John. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled Concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. So John is saying here is that God himself came to this earth. And not only did he take on a human body, but we saw him, we touched him, we heard him, we listened to him, we learned from him, we observed him. And yes, they were rebuked by him several times. Je Peter was rebuked by Jesus. Remember when Peter made that confession of faith, when Jesus said, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Some say John the Baptist. He said, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And then right after Peter's confession, when Jesus began to talk about his pending crucifixion, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, Peter could not imagine Jesus going to the cross. And he said, Lord, forbid it to be, you know, no. That's not going to happen. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, for you an offense to me. Peter was rebuked by the Lord Jesus Christ. So they experienced these things. And they knew that he had a body. And John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. We studied him. We, we watched him. We listened to him. We learned from him. And says, we beheld his glory. Uh, and beholding his glory is the imagery uh, like I mentioned, the tabernacle, when the Shekinah glory filled the, the tabernacle in the wilderness and Solomon's temple. But also the vision that Isaiah had in Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse eight, verses 1 through 8. Isaiah tells us here in Isaiah 6, beginning in verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Now, did any of you watch the coronation of King Charles yesterday? You know, we don't really care. We're Americans. You know. the toad, I told Jan yesterday, the frog became king yesterday. Because I've always called Prince, uh, when he was Prince Charles, Prince Toad, because that's what he reminds me of. Well, he was crowned yesterday. Carrie, you like that imagery? But now the toad has become a king. But... I noticed when they came out, I, I didn't watch it. Uh, we did flip over yesterday morning for a little bit. He was already been crowned. And when they came out on the balcony, and as they turned to go, but you didn't notice it when they came out on the balcony, uh, King Charles and Queen Camilla. But when they turned to go off of that balcony and go back inside, those little boys they had there in their red coats and dressed up very fancy. Sherry, did you see it? Uh, if not, yeah, I thought maybe you saw it. Anyways, what did they do? They picked up the, the train of the robe of the king and the queen. I don't know about the king, but I know that for the queen, there was a train, I believe his robe possibly had a train behind it. You know, that long stretch, like a wedding gown. We call that long. Guys, have you ever looked at a wedding dress and wondered why it's got that long train behind it? I, I don't know. I don't have the answer for you, but that's what I'm talking about. And it says here, Isaiah says, the train of his robe filled the temple. The temple would have been built larger than this building right here. Imagine the train of the robe filling the temple. It speaks of the glory. It speaks of the majesty of God. And Isaiah saw this. It says, and the train of his robe filled the temple, and above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy as the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When Isaiah sees this, and he sees the glory of God, what does he do? He says, Woe is me, for I'm undone. He said, I'm a sinful man. That's when he says, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. He says, I'm a sinful man. And yet I'm in the presence of a holy God. And God's glory overwhelmed Isaiah there when he, when he had this vision of God's glory. And John says here, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And this word only begotten, it means one and only, one of a kind. See, there, Mormons 
teach that Jesus and Lucifer are spirit brothers. Lucifer, Satan, is not a son of God. There is one son of God, and his name is Jesus. Satan, Lucifer, is a fallen angel. He is a created being who rebelled against God and failed, but he is not a son of God. Only Jesus is the Son of God, not a Son of God. He is the Son of God. And so those that that teach that are wrong. Jehovah's Witnesses talk about Jesus being a Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God, the one and only. And he says, and we... uh, We beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Over in John chapter 3, verse 16, a verse that we most of us know by heart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. His one and only. No other like him at all. And John says, we beheld him as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Full of grace and truth. Think about it. He says full. He's not half full. He's not three quarters full. He is full of grace and truth. And here is the thing. God knows everything about us. That's truth. And yet God loves us and extends mercy and forgiveness to us. That is grace. Grace is God giving to us what we do not deserve, what we have not earned. Mercy is withholding from us what we have earned and what we do deserve. But in God's mercy, he does not pour his wrath out on us. His wrath was poured out on his son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, who was laid in the tomb and who bodily came forth out of that tomb three days later for us. He he died and paid our price for us and we have the forgiveness of sins and Jesus came. He is full of grace and truth and I want to tell you something. I don't care where you've been, what you've done, how, how much sin you've committed. God's grace is greater than your sin. Paul tells us in the book of Romans that where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. I am thankful for that because I want to tell you something. As uh, I believe it was uh, Charles Spurgeon who said that I, I I'm a sinful man in need of great grace, and we serve a God who is full of grace, who has grace abounding, and his grace abounds towards us. And so that's what John is telling us in verse 14. And then he says in verse 15, John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And John chapter 3, verse 30, John would say there about Jesus, he said, he must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist would say that I'm not worthy to stoop and to loose his sandal straps uh, or the straps of his sandals. So when John bore witness, this John in verse 15 is John the Baptist, not John the Apostle. There's two Johns that we will be talking about here. He's talking about John the Apostle. is talking about John the Baptist, two different people. But John the Baptist bore witness to him and said, this is he of whom I said. He showed up and began baptizing, preaching people, uh, the need for people to repent and to be baptized and to do works, giving evidence of repentance. And the religious leaders, why is John writing this gospel? To let us know that Jesus is the Son of God who came to this earth and that we need to repent of our sins. We need to trust him. And he just says, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Not only was Jesus preexistent, Jesus, Jesus is preeminent. He is the preeminent God. Then he says here in verses 16 and 17, And of his fullness we have all received. Second Peter 1, 3. Listen, we've got all we need right now. You have everything you need to follow, obey, and to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second Peter 1, 3 tells us, As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. God's given you everything you need to live a holy life right now. God's given you everything you need to follow him. You just need to believe and follow, to believe and to obey Follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got everything you need to live a holy life now. It's just making application of what God has given you. You're not lacking anything. When you say, well, I, you know, I just wish I could be a better Christian. You're not lacking any good thing. 
He's given all things and says, And of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace, grace upon grace, grace without end. That is good news. That you and I cannot exhaust the grace of God. You and I cannot go so far that we exceed the love of God. And we received that. And he says, For the law was given through Moses. See, the law just shows us our sinfulness. And the law shows us that we need to. And see, in the law, the, the Ten Commandments, but then you also had the ceremonial law and the sacrificial law of the sacrifices. They knew that didn't bring eternal life. It brought, it would grant them forgiveness of their sins. They would bring a sin offering and these kind of things. But he said the law came through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad that you don't have to bring a, a calf, a goat, a sheep, a turtle dove, a pigeon, a ram, a bull, whatever, that you don't have to bring that down here to the church to be sacrificed? That you don't have to weekly or monthly or quarterly or what, offer us that Jesus is our sacrifice for us fully and completely. And grace and truth came through Jesus. He talked about, I mentioned that just a moment, about, about truth. And he says grace and truth came through him. And then he says, wrapping up what we're looking at today, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. He has made him known. That's what he means there. And see, in John chapter 14, verse 6, now, you and I, you may have heard this passage. You know, you're familiar with John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes unto the Father except through me. But at the beginning of John 14, you've heard this perhaps at a funeral funeral message when it says Jesus said let not your heart be troubled you believe in God believe also in me in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I go to prepare a place for you and if I go and prepare a place for you I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am there you may be, a, be also and where I go you know and the way you know Thomas said to him Lord we do not know where you're going and how can we know the way Jesus said I am the way the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can, he say, how can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works uh, does the works. Believe, it, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. And the, the Pharisees, when they wanted to stone Jesus, Jesus said, for what good work do you seek to stone me? And they said, for not, a, not for doing a good work, but because you make yourself to be the Son of God. They fully understood the claims of Christ. And so somebody tells you that Jesus never claimed to be God. They're lying. Because Jesus clearly said that himself. He said, I and my Father are one in John 10. We're going to see that in the weeks to come. And Jesus has declared the Father. You know how you know God? You know Jesus. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know God. And if you don't know Jesus, you don't have any peace. And the only way to have any peace is to know Jesus. Jesus is the only hope. And I want to tell you something. Regardless of where you're at in your walk with Christ, most everyone I believe here today are followers of Christ, but we all need to be closer to Christ than, we, what, we, than what we are. I need it. And let's just be honest. We get caught up in everyday life. We get caught up in relationships uh, with our spouses, with our families, with our children, our grandchildren, our parents, we, in the workplace. We need to reflect Christ everywhere we are at. Whether it's in a classroom, Sherry, with a bunch of wild youngins, because there's other teachers and paraprofessionals that watch those. And those children watch, don't they? They're listening. We need to be living for Christ. I want to challenge you. Yield completely and follow him, for he's worthy.
Would you stand and let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for the eternal life that we have through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And Lord, you didn't just save us so that we might have eternal life, although we are saved to eternal life. You also saved us that we might be obedient followers of you, proclaiming your love, proclaiming your forgiveness, and extending that to others, being a faithful witness. So, Lord, help us be found faithful. Forgive us of where we fail you. And we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen.